welcome to the Flying Focus 10th bus anniversary. My name is Dan Handelman and I'm one of the founding members of Flying Focus Video Collective, a group which began producing videos on public policy issues in the 1991 in the wake of the so-called Gulf War. This year is an exciting one for Flying Focus because it's 10 years since we got together and 10 years since we launched our weekly show. It was November 18, 1991 when the first episode of the Flying Focus video bus was cable cast. So this year, in addition to looking at programs we produced over the last year and letting you know what we look like, we'll also be giving you a quick look back at some of the programs we've covered over the last 10 years on the video bus. Don't be discouraged, even though the U.S. has launched a new war on October 7 in retaliation for the horrendous attacks on New York and Washington, we're still out here giving voice to the voiceless. Our videos have been shown from coast to coast in the U.S. in several places in Europe and Canada. We've covered topics of human and animal rights, war and peace, racism, sexism, media bias, environmental justice, and much more. And as you will see, we're not professionals, so you can do this too. This past year, we produced uh, 24 new episodes of the video bus uh, for a total of 18 different programs, as well as one speakers and events show. And you'll hear about that too. So sit back, join us as we look back at a decade of using video as a tool for social change. On November 18, 1991, Flying Focus began a weekly series called The Flying Focus Video Bus, a showcase of works of member producers and associated activists using video. The video bus is sometimes a finished piece, sometimes a work in progress, sometimes an event, sometimes a speaker, but it's always informative. If you watched Rodney King on video being beaten to the ground, realize what you actually saw for yourself. You and it did not happen because we weren't willing to work. It did not happen because we were on drugs or mentally ill, like they say about homeless people. It happened because there are no programs to help you. There when I learned to my dismay, the day were dying fast. So I moved away to another land where I hope that they could laugh. In reading the protests, we look at demonstrations and public events. Well, one of the problems that I've, that I've noticed with rallies is that they tend to overbook for speakers. In North Yorkshire, on the moors, there is uh, an American spy base with 20 golf ball radio. In Lyle, uh, Washington, that they need some help in, in uh, preserving this beautiful spot. Yeah, I'm the radio guy. My name is Jim. And the purpose of my program, as I said in every program, was to teach people how to use uh, shortwave radio. I'm a steel worker by trade, and you know, for me to be in front of the camera is really, really difficult for me. Uh, I, I, I take some turns behind the camera. I call it the system. It's, it's incorporating all these channels and marshes and, and wetlands and lakes. It was about 23.5 square miles originally, you know, before the white people made these changes. Some of the work we do is, is pretty much a collaborative effort with other people in the community that are working for social change. This is now August 1992. We've had 50 people arrested at the Clackwood Arm Bridge. The four of us co-produced. We also have some other members who helped us with research and, and taking footage. It was a very extensive piece on Haiti, Cuba, and the U.S. media. He's a black man based in New York. Um, should be gay. He's so sweet. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I hate to put it up. One of the things I like best about Flying Focus is that we go out and take lectures of people that you wouldn't normally see on TV. Why uh, your urban neighborhood uh, could, should, in fact, be made more livable and more self-sufficient. I did a roundtable discussion this year with people who are self-proclaimed anarchists. And that people, instead of being controlled by investment bankers on Wall Street who make decisions about their lives, ought to make their own decisions about their workplaces. What was happening in Yugoslavia could potentially happen here. People are killed daily there, and you have to, and you never know. It. That the only genuine healing that can happen in a victim's family is when they learn to let go of that hate, to give up that desire for revenge. I believe the fur industry is a bad thing, you know. Leave the coats where they belong on the animals. I'm, I'm interested in Flying Focus. I just feel like um, we provide an alternative and critical voice that's not choked out by the corporate media. You know, that is so sick. I, yeah. I can't even understand why they've named this disease Mad Cow. We're the, we're the ones that are mad to be feeding, exactly. you know, a cow its own relatives. Right. Across the oceans, I haven't seen them. For years, 
and she asked me for aspirin. Trying to get people to uh, look at the military budget and realize how much of our taxes are going for things that we really don't believe in as progressive people. The four-day march that a number of people took from Portland to Salem. If you travel outside this country and tell people you're in favor of the death penalty, they look at you like you are out of your mind. There is power in the union. For someone coming out of hotels, being a low-wage worker my whole life, the only thing I ever had in life was hope. The common theme in these shows is that everyone in them values life more than money. My name is Patch Adams. I am a physician and clown. I entered medicine 30 years ago to use medicine as a vehicle for social change. And get to know amazing women who've come into the shelter right. and hear stories of survival that right. just are absolutely incredible. Yeah, I got to tape Eldridge at the Earth Day last... Before he died, last program, maybe, huh? Yeah, it was a week or so before he died. I told you you should have let me kill that guy. And he was talking about me. Among the major stockholders of the three largest broadcasting networks are Chase Manhattan, J.P. Morgan Bank, and Citibank. Uh, you're not getting a raise. You're shoved into an HMO that doesn't work for you. You come to this point for an hour and a half, you're going to have a good laugh. Exposing corporate greed. Recently, there have been layoffs at the Nike headquarters. It's unprecedented. Their stock is plummeting. This is not good news. They're laying off workers in Indonesia. Do it, you know, not Nike. Do it, you know. And we have to find a way to utilize this independent media we have. We have computers, we have sampling stuff. Portland General Electric broke the spending record for the most amount of money that had been spent up to that time in, within the initiative process. We are spending one half of our discretionary budget on weapons of mass destruction and on the military. Vietnam vets who fought in, in Vietnam, uh, we really know what the bombings do. And the bombings are terrible. It's a terrible thing. Before I went to this contest, I knew nothing, zilch, zero, about the Spice Girls, about any of it. Hey, Portland, we're the Spice Girls. Tell me what you are, what you really want. I had a new appreciation for how much work it is to do what they do. Why don't we fight each other? Why do we destroy life? Why do we create strife? I'm Kyle Yamada. While discussing the human rights situation in Tibet. If you look at the equation between Tibetan and Chinese, there's now close to 8 million Chinese with the 6 million Tibetan. Being on the ward, it was just jammed with people. All of this is because of poverty and they cannot offer the milk which is required. For. She's waiting for the death of her baby. Especially about the little children. We went to refugee camps along the Sierra Leone border. If there is no information center, how will they know where to go? I'm PC Perry, Flying Focus Video Collective, and we are about to talk about the clips that Barb and I have done uh, together, and uh, there are four of them. What did we do, Barb? Well, you taped them, PC, or trained other people while taping these shows, and I edited them. The vast majority of people who eat animal products and even base their diets on animal products in this culture love animals. They love their animals. They would be horrified to learn how the animals involved in modern food production are treated. When we see it, when we really see it, then we have the chance to take a stand. Then we have the opportunity to bring our life choices and our food choices into alignment with our caring. So that was John Robbins, um, who gave up his life of privilege with the Baskin-Robbins family mm -hmm. to talk about, to give us this kind of information. Mm -hmm. And you taped this with? April Adams. Uh-huh. Right. And um, Was there someone else there? Was it Carrie Jones? Yeah. Right. And April also helped with this uh, next, the clip of this next show that we're going to see, which was the? Non-fatal bite? Right. Good. So Good. this is Sherry Speed, the founder of um, 
a sanctuary for chimpanzees in Cameroon, Africa. It all started with three chimpanzees in Limbe, Cameroon. Um, their names are Pepe, Jackie, and Becky. Um, I first met them in January 1997. And then later in the year in 1997, Edmund Stone and I made a commitment to do something for these guys. Uh, Jackie, the oldest of the three chimpanzees, had been in a single cage at a resort hotel since the 1960s. Uh, so for over 30 years, he's close to 40 years old now. And the other two chimps, Peppy and Becky, had been there, no, we don't know for sure, because there had been two other chimps there before who had died. And nobody was quite sure when the others died and when Peppy and Becky came. But they had been there. We knew it, it, was, a, it was over 10 years. And Jackie was so angry, I had never touched him um, when he was awake. We had we uh, screened our chimps for TB and for viruses, and I'd been able to touch him when he was anesthetized, but I'd never been able to get close to him when he was awake um, because he was understandably very angry and he had hurt some people who had come too close to his cage. But Edmund and I made this commitment that we wanted to get these chimps out of these cages and into a sanctuary somewhere. And we came back to the States and we started raising money for that and then we discovered that there weren't any facilities that were able to take these three adults and especially Jackie who was dangerous um, and all adult chimps are very strong and certainly chimps who have lived in those kind of captive circumstances for so many years. Um, so it became clear that in order to help these three chimps we were going to have to start something new. Um, in addition to our adults, we have six babies, and all of our babies have come very injured, um, most of them with shotgun pellets. Um, one of them had a machete wound to his head, but they're all doing great. We have a, a wooden nursery building with an electric enclosure um, that in, uh, encircles a tract of forest, and the, the baby chimps are in and out of the forest. So this next clip is Dr. Ray Greek, mm -hmm. a former animal researcher, talking about why animal research is bad for human health and that the results don't correlate between humans and animals. Exactly. And that usually why the research is done is for the grants. Right, for the money, exactly. Mm -hmm. My talk this evening can really be summarized with this slide. Obviously some animals are like us and some animals are not. So the question that the animal experimenter has to ask himself is which animal is like the human being? And I'll give you an example of this. And I'll give you, and this example shows in a nutshell why animal experiments don't work. Thalidomide, as you all may remember, was a medication given to pregnant women for morning sickness in the late 1950s and early 1960s. It caused a birth defect known as phocomelia. And after this birth defect had been demonstrated in humans, unfortunately, this drug was tested on many species of animals, including rabbits, and sure enough, the rabbit did react to uh, thalidomide exactly as the human being did. So perhaps the rabbit is a good model for testing drugs or learning about human diseases. But about 40 years earlier, a man named Alexander Fleming had tested a brand new drug that he had discovered called penicillin on a rabbit. And based on that one experiment on this rabbit, Alexander Fleming put penicillin back on the shelf for over 10 years because, you see, penicillin didn't work on that rabbit. Now, penicillin did work on mice, and about 10, 15 years after Alexander Fleming discovered it, it was tested on mice, and because it worked on the mice, it was developed and given to human beings. But interestingly, thalidomide had also been tested on mice prior to being released. And thalidomide did not induce the birth defect phocomelia in mice. And therein, ladies and gentlemen, lies the problem with animal experiments. You don't know which animal is going to mimic the human condition until after you already know how the drug is going to work on the human being. In other words, it's a catch-22. So who taped that show? Let's see, April Adams in support and Miriam Allo uh, made the tape available. Her husband did the lighting and I was on camera. All right. Mm -hmm. And that was the same um, event at the Hollywood Theater um, where Matt Rossell spoke. Right. And this next clip is from his talk about why animal research is bad for animals. Primate research is inherently cruel. It needs to stop. Until that day comes and 
It's going to be a long road. We need to start caring for them better. Experts from inside and outside the industry agree on one thing, and that is that when you take a monkey and put them alone in a cage, or you maternally deprive a monkey, that is taking infant monkeys and taking them away from their mothers too soon, it has devastating results. And OHSU will remind you that they are a flagship institution. OHSU and OHSU's Primate Center is state of the art. And so the video images that you'll see tonight and the conditions that are at the Primate Center are about the best the industry has to offer. It only gets worse from here. Um, I'm gonna go into some detail now about some of the behaviors that are typical for monkeys at the Primate Center. The first one is stereotopy, and this is, this is what the industry um, calls circling and pacing. And there's a whole lot of this going on. In fact, stereotopy is so common that at the Primate Center, we don't even try to address this issue. Uh, it's just, you, you see it quite a bit. And the, uh, the other thing is that there isn't really a cure for it, besides getting them into a better environment where they're not housed in a tiny cage. And this monkey I named Clark, and he was a male monkey at the Primate Center who had a case open for self-aggression and also for depression. And depression in primates looks a whole lot like depression in people. A lot of these monkeys would stop eating when they were depressed, and um, you can just see it in their faces. Clark was an example. None of my interventions worked with him, and finally, when he got socially housed, Miraculously, all of his problems went away. We're talking this section with uh, Lindsay, and it's about uh, the diversity conference that Yvonne Simmons worked on. Um, she had a disability with uh, nerve cell damage, and so she had a uh, good proximity to the information, the topic. What did you do on the uh, project? I operated the camera and edited the piece. What was it about? It was a conference about diverse abilities and if there is a disability culture, and if there is a culture, what does that mean? The reason for my being here today is to, to allow people to voice their individual perspectives of what disability is to them, whether or not they believe a culture of disability exists, and if they think that they fit into that culture of disability and how they define it as individuals. Our need for access, whether it be for people with hearing impairments, whether it be for people with sight impairments, whether it be for those of us who have mobility impairments, the improvements that we make in the surrounding society increase the value of everyone else's life. One of the most important recognitions after we started implementing curb cuts was that parents with children in strollers found it easier to negotiate their own communities. So I think that we bring great value to society. I think that we have, unfortunately, been defined by others. And I'm just happy to be here to have an opportunity to take part in our self-determination and our self-definition. Uh, people in Portland need to know that Portland, Oregon, was one of the first places to have a psychiatric survivor organization during this uh, during these last 30 years it was insane liberation front there's now a diverse movement of mental health consumers and clients and psychiatric survivors all over the world some people define themselves as being mentally ill and and identify themselves as having a biochemical problem a lot of other people reject that totally and say like I do that uh, I don't have a biochemical disorder that if they say that we're mentally ill they should prove it so there's a lot of diversity uh, among psychiatric survivors and there's a lot of dis diversity here too uh, in this year I produced five shows and three of them focused on police accountability one involved Dora McRae an African-American woman who at age 68 was pulled out of her van by a Portland police officer after allegedly failing to signal a turn. McRae sued the city and eventually lost. She also filed an internal affairs complaint which brought her to city council in March 2001. The day of her council hearing, the NAACP chapter at Portland State University held a forum on racial profiling to set the tone. Racial profiling is when someone is arrested, pulled over, or um, searched or seizured because of um, their ethnicity or their race. 
and um, that can also be by the cops. It can be by campus security or even mall security. And the allegation that you're making, is it for how he removed you from the car, or what's the behavior that you think was below the standard of the police officer? Is it stopping you? Is it pulling you out of the car? What, what exactly is your... Opinion? I don't even know how he pulled me out of the car. I didn't say he pulled me out of the car because I don't know. But that's what he said he did. He said he pulled me out of the car. I don't remember. I was not conscious. Right, and pulling your arm up against the door jam again to establish lever, leverage and pressure and control the shoulder of the person, and then we could try to affect the San Cadre from this position. Um, and what ended up happening, according to the officer's report, I wasn't there, it's, it's hard to tell, but what ended up happening was the officer used a, an arm bar to take the person out of the car. I believe you also have a 68-year-old female, a senior citizen, and you have a van. I mean, this is not a car, we're talking about a van full-service van, not a minivan. This is a van where the seat is at least three or four feet off the ground. Now, if you look at the procedures, the general procedures about the use of physical force, it says a member of the Bureau may use physical force when they reasonably believe it is necessary to make an arrest or prevent an escape. And I do not believe it is reasonably necessary to use the level of force that Officer A used to take Ms. McRae out of the van. In another case that went before the citizen advisors to Payak, a man who alleges he was beaten by police was given a second chance for his complaint to move forward. After hearing the evidence, which you'll hear excerpts of here, regarding leading questions and other irregularities, Payak voted to change the finding in his case. I also found that, um, that quite a rampant use of leading questions. Um, and each of the officers were led by, by the questions and they each responded um, almost virtually each time repeating the exact wording that the interviewer used in the questions. Regarding uh, interviews, this is the about the uh, suggestion that leading questions have been used. I know leading questions have been discussed in many cases. The uh, examples given here today are not, again, leading questions. Let me refer to page six, where the first question here states, did you recall why Officer B chose to use pepper spray? Was the guy still resisting? That is not a leading question. That is a direct question. A leading question would be, this guy is still resisting. That's why you use pepper spray, isn't it? Mm -hmm. oh, oh, oh. oh, that is so funny, because he says it's not a leading question the way it was asked, because he said, was the guy still resisting, instead of, it was because the guy was still resisting, wasn't it? And the answer, I want to remind you, was I suspect it was because the guy was still resisting. So he basically he just put words in the officer's mouth. The appellant alleged that during his arrest, officers caused his elbow to pop while handcuffing him, resulting in torn, torn ligaments. Additionally, he, chart, he alleged that an officer hit him in the head and jaw, and an officer sprayed him with aerosol restraint during the process of handcuffing him. The appellant also alleged that an officer videotaped the arrest the complaint was categorized by internal affairs as use of force, which I've already defined. Finally, PC and I worked on this show about Portland's Joint Terrorism Task Force, and we had a pretty big crew on this one. It was. It was the uh, kind of thing I've been wanting to do for years, collaborative effort. We had uh, Jason, Christenia, Jamal, and uh, Christenia's husband, uh, Cyrus. So, as you'll see, a number of folks from different backgrounds were concerned about the task force violating civil rights and we did a lot of public education around its potential dangers in the city and the task force just barely got renewed by a council vote of four to one in mid-October. The, the criminal intelligence unit is currently housed within the uh, FBI building. Um, this agreement would allow Portland officers to receive federal credentialing um, security clearances to participate in criminal investigations involving terrorism issues. Uh, the cases that go before the Joint Terrorism Task Force uh, involve cases with, with a federal concern. This allows the Federal Bureau of Investigation to share information uh, with the Criminal Intelligence Unit and the Portland Police Bureau, and uh, likewise, Intelligence Unit to share information with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
The community in general, I think, should be concerned, and labor in particular, because the FBI historically does not have a good track record, to put it mildly, um, in regards to knowing where the line is between people that are getting ready to do some sort of criminal act or practice terrorism and people who are just practicing their normal American civil liberties to organize a union, to protest, to fight for civil rights for black folks, to fight for civil rights for gay folks or whoever. Especially in the African American community, we remember that from Dr. Martin Luther King's day and Malcolm X's day, that when people were fighting for equality, uh, there were massive FBI files being kept. To have an ordinary rally, to have a protest, but knowing that uh, you're being surveilled in a way that uh, is, is potentially mixing our rights with um, uh, and, and being defined as a terrorism is a very, very unacceptable type of situation. Back in the 50s, uh, during a, you know, a, a Red Scare period, people were afraid to sign petitions. People were afraid to go to meetings because the Red Squad or the task force or the something like that was watching. And so really it affects us all because even if we're not activists, our lives are made better by the work of activists. That does it for part one of the uh, 10th bus anniversary. And uh, if you want to get involved with Flying Focus Video Collective or be a supporter, contact us at 239-7456. Or you can also write to us on email at ffvc at agora.rdrop.com. And thanks for watching us and tune in next week at uh, the same time, the same, same station stations. for uh, part two.